Next up is Glenn Yoger. Uh, he will talk about unleashing the positive potential of AI. Glenn, are you located in Madrid or in, in the US? Oh, that's uh, an interesting question. The answer is always <laughs> up in the air, but this time I'm in Madrid, Spain. Okay, so you're here in Europe. <laughs> so you're the founder and the CEO of Euroelectrics? Euro Ultralytics, that's right. Yeah, well, Ooh, what's your company I do doing? everything around here. But uh, these days we're most famous for our YOLO models. So YOLO is one of the most popular uh, vision AI models. These days, a lot of the buzz is about chat GPT, but this is a different world. This isn't generative AI, this is AI that extracts information from images. So, and these are proprietary AI uh, solutions, I guess? Oh, no, these are open source, they're free, and uh, millions of people are using these around the world. They're probably some of the most popular models in the world for vision AI. Uh, and they have a famous story also. The original author is no longer working on them. So we picked up his work and sort of carried the torch. Enlighten us. The floor is yours, man. <laughs> okay. okay, great. So I've got a few slides here. Um, I'm going to share the YOLO backstory and how we got to where we are today and highlight some real interesting use cases uh, around the world that people are doing with these models. Okay, so let's do here, I've got my desktop and I'm going to uh, play these slides. So, okay, uh, we're on the last slide. So let's go back to the beginning. Let's see here. Okay, so the story starts uh, with a question and the question really is now that we've got these amazing AI models, uh, what, what can we do with these? How can we make the world a better place with this technology? Uh, but it didn't start here. It started uh, about almost 10 years ago. So I'm Glenn, I'm the founder here at Ultralytics. Uh, we're a small company, we're about 10 people, but we started just with one person back in 2014. And we initially got started working with particle physics applications for U.S. intelligence agencies. So these are some agencies in the D.C. area in Washington, D.C., and they were interested to see what they could do with antineutrinos, which are a real interesting particle. Uh, so we started applying AI to the data analysis side of these antineutrino experiments. And this ultimately uh, didn't go anywhere. The program was a bit of a disaster and it got shut down. But in the process, we developed an expertise in AI for regression and for classification. And uh, I'd also taken an interest in the applications for AI in the vision space, which were much more popular and much more ubiquitous. So when we published a physics paper with AI techniques, they would get very few citations, but I'd look over at our colleagues in the vision space and they'd have thousands of citations. And I realized, wow, this is really making a big impact. Uh, and, and so I migrated our efforts over into vision. And by vision, I mean anything that's like an image or a video, a YouTube video, a webcam stream. So uh, about three to four years ago, uh, there was a researcher that was working on the initial YOLO models. So YOLO stands for you only look once. And the YOLO models at the time, about four to five years ago now, were a big breakthrough because the existing architectures, which are called RCNN, faster RCNN, they had a two-stage process where they look at an image and then isolate the interesting areas and then drill deeper into those. Uh, YOLO was the first real model that did this all at one pass. So it just had to look at the image once and it did the same thing, which was detect the objects inside it. So if there were people, cars, dogs, it would spot those. And this guy's name was Joseph Redman. Uh, he's one of the most famous guys in the AI space now. Uh, but uh, he left the, the creation of the models because he saw that the military was interested in this. So the YOLO models that he created, which are YOLO version one, two, and three, got so popular that he started getting invited to lots of talks. And he ultimately ended up at a TED talk uh, where a military general approached him and said, this is amazing stuff. We'd like to put this in some drones, use it on the battlefield. And Joseph was uh, adamantly against that. And he ultimately opted to uh, stop research on the YOLO models so that anything that he did couldn't be used in that fashion. And so this meant that, that after YOLO version three, there was real no uh, centralized R&D going on, but a few people sort of picked up the torch and started maintaining the work that he'd done. So all of this was open source, and this is uh, an amazing 
uh, aspect of the open source community is that once your work is out there, other people can fork it, they can improve it, they can maintain it. And that's what's been going on the last few years uh, in the YOLO world, which is where we live. So uh, this now is about three years ago, 2020. And I started working on improvements to the models that he designed, not just myself, but some other researchers. And ultimately this led to what's now called YOLO V5, uh, which is the world's most popular model for object detection uh, and some other tasks now like segmentation. Uh, so these models uh, enjoyed amazing, amazing uh, popularity. So in the last few years since we've launched them, we've picked up 50,000 GitHub stars and we have uh, more than a million people coming by and looking at the models, downloading them, using them. And it's just turned into tremendous success. Um, but the irony here is that I never went to school for AI. I uh, didn't have a PhD in ML or anything like that. But I did have something that I think contributed really well, and that was an outsider perspective. So I always wanted to connect the research to the real world. And I think this is something that uh, when I arrived on the scene was a little bit lacking. Uh, so there's a lot of research going on, papers being published. Uh, but real world applications in the vision space uh, were a bit lacking. They always seem to be right around the corner, but they never quite reached fruition. And based on my particle physics life, uh, I was always dissatisfied with laboratory research. I always wanted something that was concrete, something that you could hold in your hand, something that could actually impact the world we live in day in and day out. And so this is my main focus. So I didn't want uh, an academic paper or a research breakthrough. I wanted things that actually made a real world impact. And that was my focus. And I think that's a key reason that these models have become so popular, uh, made them very easy to use, very simple. And I've always tried to keep an eye out for the ultimate purpose here, which is to make the world a better place to improve the human condition and the world we live in. Uh, so uh, part of my obsession here with making things simple is uh, is eventually also leading to 2022, which is last year. So besides YOLO, Ultralytics does a second product, which is called Hub, HUV. And this is a no-code tool to train YOLO models. Uh, the motivation here is that not all of us are programmers. And even though I've tried to make things simple, uh, training AI models is still complicated. You still need to get your hands dirty with Python. You still need to set up an environment. And that's not always easy. And so we're trying to lower the buried entry with a no-code tool. Uh, I've always said this, like once my mom is able to get in the game and start training ML models, then I'll be happy. We're not there yet, but that's our ultimate purpose is to make it so simple that anybody that wants to train a vision model and use it for anything can do that. So that brings us to 2023, which is this year. Uh, most recently, just a couple months ago, we've launched a major update to our YOLO models. And this is known as YOLO version eight. Uh, there's a gap between five and eight because uh, being an open source tool, other companies also have versions of YOLO. Uh, since they've gotten so popular, really big companies have gotten into the game, companies like Meituan in China that launched a YOLO version six. And one of the original maintainers also of YOLO v4 launched an update called YOLO v7 last year. Uh, what's next, nobody knows, but uh, we do know that it's gonna be exciting. The pace of progress, uh, is astonishing, and it's one of the things that I really love about what we do. So one of the uh, main use cases, there's so many that I can only ha highlight a few here, uh, but this has been, uh, so what we're seeing here is a video. We're seeing YOLO applied to a task, which is uh, fire detection, and this is something that's being recorded from a drone. So forest fires uh, and I think air pollution contamination in general are identified as one of the uh, UN's emphasis for uh, climate change and for sustainable development goals. And the, uh, the cause of a lot of contamination actually is forest fires, which are not caught early enough to be put out. So early detection and passing that information to early responders is one of the things that can improve this. Uh, you're in Spain, neighbor in Portugal, and even when I'm in the US and California, we have a serious, serious forest fire problem. Um, when I was in Los Angeles, we were wearing masks for COVID-19, but that year there was also serious forest fires in the Los Angeles area, and we probably would have been wearing them anyways, just because of the smoke in the air. Uh, so there are other applications too. Um, so again, YOLO can be applied to vid videos, images, any kind of streaming information, and it can be used for different tasks. So we see examples of detection here. 
Uh, in marine environments, it's applied in different ways for research, uh, um, counting uh, marine species, but also for cleaning up plastic and other trash from the world's oceans. So there's active research uh, for embedding YOLO models into submersibles, not just to detect objects in the ocean, but to actually reach out and collect those with robotic arms. So this would be a way to start cleaning up the ocean, to clean up some of the uh, trash, plastic trash especially, which takes a long time to decompose. So one of the things I really love about what I do and Ultralytics and YOLO is that we are in a David and Goliath situation. Ultralytics is very small and we work hard every day, but we're just a few people. And despite that, we're much more popular than the large players that you hear about. Companies like NVIDIA, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Baidu, Tencent, and many others. Uh, and the KPI that we're measuring here, the yardstick, uh, as it's called, is GitHub stars. This is the main measure of an open source tool's popularity. So if someone's on GitHub and they love what you're doing, they'll give you a star. And this is a plot of that over time. And so we're this red line and we've passed products offered by the big guys that do similar things. Uh, companies that have a lot of funding, a lot of teams and a lot of GPUs also. So it takes compute to train here and we get by on very little. So it's uh, willpower, a little bit of blood, sweat and tears and uh, maybe some luck that's put us in the position where we are today. But I think also our mission of trying to help everybody trying to make this simple and trying to make it usable in the real world. Uh, so we have a few uh, core competencies that we really focus on. So we communicate with everybody. If you raise an issue on our repo, we'll be there to help you. Uh, everything is free. We don't charge for our products. Um, and we're always trying to increase adoption and help out the community create tools that work with YOLO. And of course, everything is open source. So everybody can come and use the products and there's full transparency in what we do. Uh, and, and you can see right there, every day we're updating it. Uh, the YOLO models that we have are not static, but they're evolving over time. They're improving every day, not just through contributions at Ultralytics, but through the wider community. We have almost 500 contributors that have helped us improve the models. Okay, uh, so what we see here is two dots. This is an interesting slide. Um, what we have on the left is machine learning engineers in the world. So actual experts, actual deep learning engineers and ML experts, uh, it's estimated that this demographic is about a quarter of a million people around the world. Uh, and on the right side, we have developers in general, which is orders of magnitude larger. So these are iOS developers, Android developers. These are the people that actually create tools that uh, people use in the real world. And part of our mission here is to make these YOLO models and make what we do so simple that it's not just applicable to the people in this little dot, but to the entire developer community. If we can do that, uh, we can have a much, much bigger impact on the world. So again, we're not about publishing papers. We're not about uh, incrementing accuracies on a benchmark data set. We're about making something that actually makes a difference. And we've seen that through the adoption of these YOLO models by thousands of companies, individuals, organizations, even governments around the world. We're always trying to make it easier. That's our main focus, uh, which brings us to Hub. So Hub is not a model. It's a no-code tool to train YOLO models. Uh, we've uh, taken a look at an Apple and we've gotten inspiration. So when Steve Jobs like held up the iPhone and he just wanted it to work, to just work, that's the same that we want to do for AI models. Uh, we're definitely not there yet. They're complicated. Uh, some of the generative models are much easier to use. Uh, but when you're trying to create your own solution, when you're trying to take ownership of the code rather than just ping an API, that's a little bit more difficult. And that's the dominant use case for people creating products. Uh, so they'd like to have ownership of, say, like an edge device and then just run the model on the edge device. So when we think of AI, uh, AI is sort of split like the human senses. And the two dominant human senses are sight and hearing. And uh, sight corresponds to vision AI and hearing and language to uh, language AI, like the large language models that are popular these days. So they lend themselves to different usages. Large language models are large and they tend to live in the cloud and you tend to send them a very light packet of information, like a few sentences to get a response back. The vision models are the opposite. Vision models are pretty small. Uh, they could be 100 or even 1,000 times smaller than a large language model. And that means that they're small enough to run on an edge device, like your smartphone, or even low power devices, like a Raspberry Pi uh, or a Jetson Nano. 
Uh, this means that vision developers tend to want to run these devices on the edge. And we make that super simple. Uh, we allow single click export to almost every format. So you can run it on your iOS device, uh, your Android device, even cloud solutions. And um, the steps are real simple. There's only three. The first is you need some training data. Uh, you can label this with one of our integrations like RoboFlow or other labeling providers. You select a model to train. So YOLO comes in lots of sizes and flavors from very small and fast to very large and accurate. You pick which one you're interested in. And once it's trained, uh, which may take anywhere from a few minutes to a few days, depending on the size of your data set and model, then you deploy it. And we have single click export and deployment to the most popular destinations and a super cool app that you can use to see your YOLO model right there in the palm of your hand. So this all sounds really cool. Um, but how are businesses actually using this? So uh, it's great to change the world. It's great to have an open source product, uh, but you need to make some money at the end of the day. So there needs to have some kind of like business application, even if it's just to sustain your open source efforts. And one of the coolest applications here uh, is that we've seen is uh, pornography detection. So dating apps uh, and even online social media channels uh, used to have this problem and used to employ a lot of uh, people, human beings to filter images. So when you'd upload a picture, say to Twitter, someone would have to look at it and make sure that there's nothing strange going on in your picture then approve it and then it would show up. And now this process has been automated. Now these days, uh, people still try and upload questionable images. And this time a, a, a vision AI model will look at this and it'll spot things that shouldn't be there like violence, nudity, and it will uh, flag it for removal. So this has all been automated. This has streamlined the process. And this has made uh, like the world a bit of a safer, more stable place. So one of the coolest applications that I mentioned before is Eat Plastic. This is a research group in the US and they are embedding YOLO as an edge model directly on a submersible. So YOLO is working underwater and it's identifying plastic which is notoriously uh, long lived. It's got a shelf life of several million years for it to degrade. And if you don't take it out of the ecosphere, it'll stay there. So let's see. So large companies are also using this for a variety of applications. Companies like Amazon uh, are using object detection models for package tracking. Companies like uh, Shell are using object detection models for uh, research and development internally for scanning uh, oil deposits and processing the data that they get um, from a variety of sources. So this is really a technology that uh, has an unlimited use case. So we don't actually develop our end products and we're always surprised to see what people are doing with YOLO models. Uh, we always get the question, we show them what we do with YOLO and a lot of people are confused and they say, well, what's it good for? Like what, uh, what's, the, what's the idea here? And uh, it's a difficult question to answer because it's such an open-ended question. It's uh, like if you ask somebody what they do with their eyes and what their eyes are good for. So the concept is the same. Uh, the YOLO models are extracting information from any image, any video, and ultimately uh, learning things that you train them to learn. So we have a few default tasks like object detection, but they're not limited to that. Uh, anything you can train this on, like sentiment analysis uh, or other things, it can learn also. So the possibilities are really only limited by our own imagination in the space. So ultimately, uh, we've gone from knowing nothing about AI in just a few years to now having some of the world's most popular models in the space that are adopted uh, literally by millions of people. And they're creating amazing solutions for all sorts of challenges. So. Uh, now we sort of can sit back and have a bit of luxury to ask ourselves now that the technology is starting to be effective and is starting to create real world solutions. What are the things that uh, we might be able to do with it? And this is uh, a challenge that I leave for the community and for all the YOLO users out there uh, to see what can be accomplished and what the possibilities are. So that's my last slide. And I think we may have uh, a bit of Q&A here. Can you answer that question yourself? <laughs> Can I answer myself? Yes, uh, I have a particularly selfish interest in the possibilities here. So coming from particle physics, I got very interested in 
the limits of human knowledge in the space. So there's a lot we don't know in particle physics. And it makes me very curious. And uh, there's also the possibility that the human mind might not be able to comprehend ultimately uh, the true workings of the universe or, or even understand the experiments we need to construct and understand it better. And so this is where I would like to see something that has, uh, I guess, less constraints, uh, like a possible AGI proposed theories um, for why we're here and uh, how the universe came to be. So that's that's one of my preferred kind of like endpoints for like all this research that's going into AI. Um, sure. But like I said, there's so many more applications too that can affect us more literally day to day. Uh, Edward has also has a question. We have a question from Shaheen and she asked mm -hmm. if you have um, some uh, examples of smaller businesses. The examples uh, were very nice that you stated, but do you have something mm -hmm more relatable to us small entrepreneurs or bigger entrepreneurs? Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, let's see here, there's, uh, there's a very cool app called Dog Tector and it's trained on species of dogs. It uses YOLO uh, to take a look at a dog and uh, tell you whether it's a German Shepherd or a Labrador. So there's a small company that's built that. Uh, there's also a very, very cool application right here in Madrid. There's a, a company which is putting cameras on billboards and monetizing the billboard, not based on other metrics, but based on exactly how many people look at it. So they can, they can track people walking by in the street, uh, but not just that, they can also track their faces and they can track their eyeballs and they can see when they look at the billboard. Uh, so this is an unfunded startup here in Madrid and they've just started doing this for like two or three billboards. Um, there's so many applications. There's another company that's built a nap for blind people to see how much money they have in their hand. Uh, so they can't tell what kind of bills they have if they're paper bills and, uh, the app will look at what's in their hand and tell them. So there's many, many small applications that can be built, uh, with YOLO. And, uh, that's, uh, that's part of the fun is like seeing all these different things that people do with it. Thank you. Marcus. Yes, we have another question from the crowd, and it's actually from David Lecker. Um, I hope I pronounced it correctly, David. And he says, and he, oh, sorry again. So we have a question from David Lecker. David, I hope I uh, pronounced your name correctly. And uh, Glenn, he's interested in your business. He says, what's the investment landscape like for you right now? And oh. you said a couple of times you were pretty pretty small so what's your growth plan that's that's very interesting so this is where the research that we do and the sort of startup trajectory are not aligned in the sense of what a vc would like to see so personally as a founder i have different priorities than scaling this and making a lot of money i'd like it to have a much more impact and so i'm happier to drive adoption uh rather than narrow the use case and uh, increase revenue. So we've successfully monetized this and uh, we're doing this with licensing. So YOLO is all open source uh, under a GPL license, which means that researchers can use it and companies can use it. Anybody can use it for anything they want, but if they want to uh, keep that private, then they require a license. And we've been charging money for these licenses. We just started a few months ago and it's proven very successful. But in general, the answer to this question uh, it's always complicated. Running an open source startup is never easy. Uh, you always get a bit of a suspicious look when you talk to investors. And the general advice that you get is to uh, not open source your work, to create a proprietary product, and to big a, build a big paywall and try and sell that uh, in a very narrow scope, in a very isolated sense, like say target manufacturing. And that's not what I want to do. I want to open this. I want to have unlimited use cases. And that's uh, not what they want to hear. So. We've had very interesting conversations with VCs. Uh, and in my experience, um, I've grown a bit disillusioned because I came into the startup world thinking if you had an idea and it had potential, a VC would realize that. Uh, but in the end, it's really about money. So you have to uh, prove that you're gonna make a lot of money with your idea, no matter what the idea is. It's what it is. But still, I really like the application on fire detection for the greater good. Um, I think that's just amazing that the trash collection really nails problems that we have 
all across the world right now. So I'm um, super happy to see that, super psyched, and, and, and really your role model, uh, Glenn. Thanks for that. And I think we have yeah, another question, yeah. Right? yeah, we do have another question. Yeah. yeah. We have a question um, by Jeff, and he asked, is the pornography and the violence detection model available to everyone? Oh, okay, this is funny. So we, as I mentioned before, we don't create our own end solution. So we don't have an off-the-shelf solution for pornography detection, but we make the tools to create that super simple. Uh, so you could create one of your own, uh, and I'm sure there's some data sets out there to do that. So sometimes training a model is uh, just a thing of a few hours. A lot of the problem is collecting the data set beforehand, but for something like this use case, I have a feeling uh, there would be some data sets out there. <laughs> If not, it would be an interesting job to put one together. <laughs> if we have yeah, we just have one more question from Wout van Vliet. Are all competitor models from Meta Alphabet uh, not open source? And secondly, is the competition using your open source Yodo tech? Oh, that's very interesting. Yes, uh, a lot of the other YOLO models out there <laughs> are based in whole or in part on YOLO v5. Um, and to answer the other question, not all the models out there are open source. So these days, of course, the most famous use case uh, would be the GPT models coming from OpenAI. And OpenAI started uh, with the idea of, of open sourcing their work and uh, acting as a nonprofit. And they sort of migrated away from both of those. And uh, But we see in the name that the intention was originally there. So now GPT is proprietary. Uh, they offer no information about how they train it or anything like that. So we're sort of moving in the direction of control of some of these largest models being in the hands of just a few players that have access to resources. And that's something that I'd like to balance out. So with our models, we make them small. They're very easy to train. They, uh, they're for different applications, but it's always been my goal to try and make this easily accessible to the little guy, uh, to people all over the world so that you don't need a lot of resources and an enormous company backing you to make a difference. So one last, que one, one last question from, uh, from me. So why should I invest in AI? <laughs> what particular part? That's a, that's a great question. Um, wow, you know, I, I would definitely invest in Ultralytics. I see a big future here. <laughs> <laughs> so I think uh, the interesting thing about AI is that we don't know where it's going to go. It doesn't have an upper ceiling. This isn't like the industrial revolution where you can build a machine or a motor and, you know, it can do the work of 10 people. Um, eventually the intelligences that we build uh, could do the work of many more people. And it's hard to determine, it's hard to extrapolate the trajectory and see where it goes. Uh, but we do know that it's going to have a large impact and uh, we'd like to keep that impact uh, beneficial to society as a whole. So. Well, thanks for sharing uh, all your insights, and I do like the model, as what Marcus is saying. Uh, I think it can have a, a tremendous contribution to society in general. Thank and you for having going. me. Yeah, and uh, there's still an open uh, invitation for you to uh, appear on the podcast, and so we can discuss more uh, into detail on the YOLO uh, <laughs> <laughs> model and the I'd love to. <laughs> Keep up the good work. Keep up the good work, yes. <laughs>